I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the DeBartolo case, Edward J. DeBartolo Corporation versus the Florida Gulf Coast Building and Trades Council. This is a 1988 U.S. Supreme Court case about constitutional avoidance by courts and Chevron deference. Now, for my students, this case comes four years after the Chevron decision. Chevron <clears throat> seems to say that we're going to give judicial deference to agency interpretations of statutes as long as the statute is unclear and the agency's interpretation is reasonable. And so, but it gets a little more complicated than that. And now scholars who have studied the Chevron cases, the cases where the court decides to give Chevron deference, say that the agency wins the vast majority of the time, probably more than 90%. And um, they usually win on step two. But there are cases where the agency loses either at Chevron step one or at Chevron step two. And we tend to study those cases in my courses because they show that there's not everything about Chevron is predictable. And this is one of those cases. So let's look at what happened in DiBartolo. So here's your big takeaway. We have problems sometimes when a reasonable agency or responsible agency has adopted an interpretation of an ambiguous statute that even though they're being reasonable, it raises constitutional questions that could have been avoided by another interpretation that was also reasonable that the agency rejected. And that is what happened here. So the DeBartolo Corporation owned a shopping mall in Florida. They actually owned a lot of shopping malls. And one of the mall tenants <clears throat> was a department store. And that department store had a dispute, a labor dispute with a labor union that was representing the construction workers who were working on a project at that department store. Pictured here is Edward J. DeBartolo, the senior, sort of the family patriarch of the company. And the dispute here though was really a straightforward fight about wages and benefits and working conditions in the late 1970s. The union members weren't making enough headway with the management of the department stores, so they started distributing handbills in the mall and in the parking lot, urging customers to boycott the mall, the whole mall, not to patronize the mall or any of its tenants until all the mall tenants, especially the department store with which the union had its dispute, agreed to pay fair wages to the union workers. In other words, the union was trying to get DiBartolo and per the owner of the mall and perhaps other mall tenants, the other stores, to put pressure on that department store to give in to the union. This is kind of a power move by the union. I hope you can see that. So initially, the DeBartolo company, the mall owner, just asked the union to please include a disclaimer in their handbill saying that their dispute was actually not with the DeBartolo company itself. And the union wouldn't do that. So they filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board saying that the union was engaging in an unfair labor practice. And the company pointed to a provision in the act, the National Labor Relations Act, that makes it unlawful for unions to threaten, coerce, or restrain any person engaged in commerce to prevent that person from doing business with any other person except through a primary strike or boycott of the other party of the dispute. So big picture here, the National Labor Relations Act generally protects the rights of workers to unionize and of the union to go on strike when collective bargaining breaks down with the management. In other words, normally, assuming that the union is following the legal rules, if they go on strike, the management can't just fire everybody who's on strike and hire replacement workers. That's against the law. We have a federal law. Nevertheless, there are some restraints on what the union can do, and they can't, they're supposed to do things that are primary boycotts, and they can't do things to engage in coercion and coercive activity. And that's what DeBartolo said they were doing here. So, again, overall, the act is set up to favor unions and protect the rights of unions to go on strike. But there are boundaries it sets on what the unions can do. And the company here said that the union had overstepped its bounds. 
So the legal question, at least initially, was whether the sort of hand billing activity that the union engaged in at DeBartolo's mall um, was coercion within the meaning of the National Labor Relations Act. And in fact, there, was, there were some earlier Supreme Court cases, one or two, that seemed to support the idea um, that it could count as coercion. In other words, that seemed to favor DeBartolo's position. Now, also note for my students, this is actually the second time this very case went up to the Supreme Court. It had gone up years earlier and the court had remanded it to the circuit court um, and then back to the trial court to make some more uh, findings of fact. And so this is actually the second time it comes up, which can make it a little confusing. The court describes this somewhat in its opinion. There's a sense in which this is De Bartolo um, uh, two. Okay, so they had the National Labor Relations Board actually held a formal adjudication or formal hearing and decided that the union's hand billing activity of calling for a boycott of the whole mall actually did qualify as coercion within the meaning of this secondary boycott prohibition in the act. So the union lost and at, <clears throat> with the administrative agency. So the union then turns to the courts and asks for judicial review of the uh, um, NLRB's decision and the adjudication. And the Supreme Court issued a unanimous decision, this wasn't a split, um, and decided in favor of the unions, which seemed to settle at the same time a larger doctrinal issue decisively. The De Bartolo opinion is explicit that the avoidance canon takes precedence over Chevron deference. And by um, this canon, if you're not familiar with it for my students, I, uh, we explain it at one point in the um, statutory interpretation and regulation course. Um, over the decades, especially in the uh, 20th century, uh, the Supreme Court adopted a rule of jurisprudence, uh, is, is all it is, <clears throat> saying that if you can avoid reaching the constitutional issue in a case, or if you can avoid construing a statute in a way that makes is going to force the court to overturn it on constitutional grounds, you should do that. In other words, it's kind of trying to save the statute from being overturned on constitutional grounds. Now, having said that, what we call the avoidance canon or judicial avoidance of trying to avoid overturning statutes it, unless it's necessary has been expressed in very different ways over the decades by different justices on the Supreme Court. And so let's look at what the court here does um, with the avoidance canon and with Chevron. So they concede that normally they would give Chevron deference and that Chevron should normally apply to a case like this where you have a, a kind of an open question about what the statute means and the relevant agency has taken a position. But they, the problem here is the First Amendment, right? That these people were passing out leaflets that were expressing truth. So for those of you who like to find kind of the, the critical line in the case to highlight or underline, I've pulled a couple out for you. The board's quote, construction of the statute as applied in this case poses serious questions of the validity of section 8B4 of the National Labor Relations Act under the first amendment. The handbills involved here truthfully revealed the existence of a labor dispute and urged potential customers of the mall to follow a wholly legal course of action, namely not to patronize the retailers doing business in the mall. And so, I, and I hope you can see that if you look at this whole situation, you could definitely construe just passing out leaflets as not coercion, right? The, the, we're not threatening people or menacing people with baseball bats or um, uh, threatening, uh, calling them in the middle of the night and, and threatening their families or anything like that to try to settle a labor dispute. We're just calling for a boycott here. And the Supreme Court thinks that that's like classic free speech, First Amendment, exactly what the founding fathers wanted to protect. So let's go on. Here's another uh, great line from the opinion. 
where an otherwise acceptable construction of a statute would raise serious constitutional problems, the court will construe the statute to avoid such problems unless such construction is plainly contrary to the intent of Congress. Every reasonable construction must be resorted to in order to save a statute from constitutionality. So if you're a little unclear on what we mean by avoidance, constitutional avoidance, or the avoidance canon in judicial interpretation, this is one of the clearest expressions from the Supreme Court about it. But keep in mind, this took place in a Chevron case. So this is one kind of permutation that we've had of the avoidance canon. And this is a pretty strong version of it, right? That we're going to, um, it, we're not going to just defer to the agency's interpretation as long as it's not crazy. We are going to do interpret, strain the words of the statute as long as it's not crazy in order to pres avoid having a constitutional problem. So where does this leave us? Even though de Bartolo is still good authority for the idea that the avoidance canon can take precedence over Chevron, that's kind of your big takeaway in my course from this case, the, please keep in mind the result is not inevitable when these two interpretive principles conflict. And so the, a very similar case to this could go the other way, right, in, the, in, uh, in another um, a day on another day with another court. So courts can and do find ways to defer to agencies, even in cases where the agency's interpretation seems to raise some serious constitutional questions. Okay, here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. If an agency's interpretation of an ambiguous statute appears to violate the First Amendment, should courts still give Chevron deference to the agency's view? Yes or no? This is supposed to be easy. If you don't know the answer to this, you weren't paying attention and should probably rewatch this video. Okay, that concludes our lecture about this case. And we will go on and continue with our discussion of some of the other sort of Chevron legacy cases.